Damer och herrar, roligt att så många är här. Jag tänkte börja med en, en ganska en tillfällighet. Eller, men det, idag är det nästan exakt hundra år sedan, eller hundra år och tre dagar sedan när vi började bygga campus här på Vallala vägen. I tisdags var det exakt hundra år sedan och sen tre år senare stod det klart. Och man kan ju fundera då när man lyssnar på de här föredragen om de som var här och invigde då 1917 var klart. Om de hade lyssnat på dagens föredrag, vad förvånade de skulle ha varit, vilken utveckling det har varit. Um, lite annan historisk återblick, det är inte lika gammalt, men när jag började här på KTH. Det är 39 år sedan, 1975 så, så hösten så hade jag matematikundervisning i den här lokalen. Och då var Christer också med, för vi var nämligen, började exakt samtidigt på samma program här på KTH teknisk fysik. Och vi var även engagerade lite i sån här spex då på teknisk fysik. Och anledningen till att jag nämner det för att det är nästan som en tillfällighet att det är spexet så var Christer utklädd till Galileo. Och, och jag var Newton. <här> och man kanske skulle kunna gissa då att, att han skulle bli astronaut eftersom Galileo höll på och intresserade rymden. Det där spexet var inte världens succé för att det kommer publiken och skrek hela tiden. När slutar spexet? När slutar spexet? Men vi hade ganska kul i alla fall. Eh, sen har jag följt Kristers eh, karriär och, eh, och vi hade då en, en diskussion när han bodde i, i Holland om, man, om vi skulle kunna få till någonting att, att Krister kunde komma tillbaka till KTH. Och det löste sig till slut och det, det är jag jätteglad för. Och, eh, det var ESA som, som har ställt upp väldigt bra och rymdstyrelsen som har hjälpt till att hitta den här lösningen. Och jag var även väldigt glad att, att Christer tog sig an det här masterprogrammet att engagera sig i utbildningen som är då kärnan egentligen för KTH. Och ganska snart kom vi in på då att, att vi skulle försöka samla KTHs rymdforskning inom ramen för ett centrum. Och det är ju därför vi är här idag. Som ni har sett är det en väldigt bred verksamhet på rymd forskning och utbildning vid KTH. Och jag är ganska säker på att det är det enskilt största universitetet i Sverige på, på den här sidan när vi samlar ihop oss på det här viset. Jag hoppas väldigt mycket då att det här centret genom att vi samlar oss på KTH, inte fysiskt, det är omöjligt, de sitter på olika ställen, men ändå i ett centrum där man träffas och diskuterar om olika möjligheter framåt att det ska kunna blir en än bättre utveckling framåt i, i tiden. Så att jag är väldigt glad att, att vara med här. Eh, själva invigningen kommer alldeles strax, har jag förstått. Så att jag kommer att vara med lite grann där också. Så tills dess så tackar jag för mig och så tror jag det är lite musik här. Tack ska ni ha. Tack så mycket Peter. Så nu ska vi höja rymdstämningen med lite musik av Fritjof Palm som ska spela den här konstig instrument för oss. Det blir, det blir spännande.
Merci, Okay, so now we are to Halve in Wiening. I switched to English here for the benefit of our uh, guest, uh, Jim. So we had a small committee who was tasked with organizing this event, and we thought, well, how can we inaugurate a space center? You know, what should we do? And uh, of course, we have to shoot some rockets, right? That's what we have to do. So that's what we will do. Um, not uh, very big rockets, I'm afraid. <laughs> so they are small rockets, but we have a unique launch system, which not even NASA uh, has, and we will now demonstrate this. So what we'll actually do is that Krista and Jim have kindly agreed to sign these rockets, and we will shoot them into the audience. So some of you will have a si rocket signed by uh, <laughs> astronauts. So prepare yourselves. So I should mention that the, uh, the launch officers today, those doing the launching, will be uh, Peter, our uh, rector, and also Leonard Nord, who is the... Uh, the uh, chairman of the board of the KTH Space Center. So here we go. <laughs> okay, so 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1. No, lift off! Wow! Now we are finally inaugurated and we can start operating and we will start with a very exciting presentation on a good friend of mine and a very experienced and distinguished astronaut, Jim Voss. And he also has his wife here, Susan Voss, who's also very experienced when it comes to space. We're working for NASA some 30 years or so. And uh, I worked also with uh, Susan. She is uh, responsible for a lot of the things that goes to the International Space Station and uh, the vehicles going there, so things which I've also been involved in. Uh, in particular, I was involved in when Jim made his last mission to space, which is a very long mission, 167 days, uh, as the second expedition, uh, with, that's what we call the crew, on the International Space Station, where Reed was starting to operate it and uh, build it there. I was then the so-called crew support astronaut, so I kind of worked with and helped him and uh, the other crew members, in particular the American part, uh, Susan Helms, but also the Russian. Uh, actually, the Russian was the ISS commander, yes, Yuri uh, Osachev, in the preparation and then helped him in going to meetings, the boring things which <laughs> they didn't have to do. Jim uh, is born in Alabama. And he has been loving flying all his life. He still has his own airplane. He goes between Houston, where Susan is still living, and uh, Colorado, where his main is working now, at the University of uh, Colorado in Boulder. He joined the uh, Air Force and is a colonel, colonel, although retired. Came to NASA in uh, 67, I think, 87, I think it was and made all in all five space missions, which is quite a nice uh, kind of crack record. Left NASA in 2003 and joined eventually, after some years, the Sierra Nevada Corporation, which is uh, one of the companies that are building now new spaceships for us, in particular, the very 
exciting called Dream Chaser. And uh, I recently left there, still all in space and uh, teaching a human spaceflight course uh, at the University of Colorado, which I'm doing here, so we have other things to share now. Well, Jim, please take the floor. I'm looking forward to what you have to say. Well, like Krister, I'm also going to do part of my presentation in Swedish and part in English. <laughs> I spent last week studying uh, Swedish very hard, so here we go. Hey! <laughs> okay, that's it for Swedish, now for English. <clears throat> uh, thank you very much for having me come to participate in the opening of your Space Center and to tell you a little bit about human spaceflight programs in the United States. Uh, we're, we're doing things a little differently. I'm going to talk about that a little bit today. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here because I love talking about space in general, and I like talking about human spaceflight in particular. Uh, Christopher and I have known each other for years. We, we met each other and began training together in Russia uh, while we were learning about the Russian Soyuz spacecraft. Became friends, we worked together in the United States, and like he said, he was supporting our mission, helping to take care of us and our families and other things while we were on the International Space Station living and working there. Uh, it's also great to see that you're establishing a space center here at KTH. That's wonderful because we have a similar type activity at my university in the United States, and Christopher and I are going to continue to collaborate and hopefully find uh, uh, possibility of our students to work together and work on space programs and design projects together in the future. That's a, a goal for us now. Before we talk about the future spacecraft, I wanted to talk a little bit about how we used to do it on board the space shuttle. This is how Christopher and I uh, Christopher and I prepared for our space flights. Usually the night before a launch, you could go out and look at the, inter at the space shuttle before it launched, and it's a very unique environment while they're loading the fuel on it, and no one is out there except sometimes the crew who go out to look around and see what's going on there. We go to sleep, if you can sleep, and the next morning we get up to have breakfast as a crew. Uh, we usually eat a very light breakfast, or a very heavy breakfast, depending on how brave you are. <laughs> then you put on your suits that we use for launching in the space shuttle, just in case there's a problem with the space shuttle and we needed to be protected, uh, we wear a pressure suit like this. And then we walk outside and get into a, a bus, a van, to take us out to the launch pad. And no one's out there at that time. It's very uh, desolate just a few people to help the crew to get on board, and we can walk around and listen to the space shuttle getting ready to go launch. And it creaks and groans and hisses, and there's noises, but there are no people around. It's a special way to prepare. And then you put on your harness, and you get ready to climb inside. Julie Payette, a Canadian astronaut here, getting ready to go into the space shuttle through the hatch behind her and to climb into her seat, where you sit laying on your back, waiting for the space shuttle launch to happen. About two hours uh, before the launch is when the crew gets on board and gets ready to go. And then we launch, and it's a really exciting event. Here's sort of what it looks like when we go to space for the first 30 seconds or so. Oh, I hope it's, no, maybe, maybe the other videos will work, I hope so. But the shuttle is a very exciting launch. But today, all the shuttles are in museums. They have retired the space shuttle, and the United States no longer has a way to get crew members to launch to the International Space Station. No one has that ability except for the Russians, and we uh, buy seats from them on their Soyuz spacecraft to take us to the International Space Station. Uh, here's what the Soyuz vehicle looks like. Christer's very familiar with it. He's certified as a commander of the, of the Soyuz spacecraft and could actually fly it back to the Earth if, if he needed to do that. So we need other ways to get to the International Space Station. Uh, it's good to have one vehicle, but it's better to have more than one in case something happens to one of your vehicles and you won't have any way for crew members to get to the space station or to return. And the United States wants to have its own capability once again to launch humans into space. 
Currently, there are multiple U.S. companies who are working on spacecraft to go to the International Space Station and other destinations. The NASA Lockheed Martin Orion spacecraft is what is going to be used to explore our solar system. It uh, has some international participation in it as well with uh, the European Space Agency is also helping with it. And then the other companies are all doing spacecraft on a commercial basis where the companies are developing these uh, spacecraft and will get to use them for other things. So maybe you could buy a ride on one in the future if you have a lot of money. The, the, the four companies, I'll describe each of them in, in a little bit of detail later, but Boeing, which is a very large aerospace company, Sierra Nevada, which is a middle size, SpaceX, which is a small one, and then Blue Origin is a very small company. They're not going to orbital space yet, they're going to just do suborbital, but all of these receive some money from NASA, the American Space Agency. Here's what the U.S. is doing with their exploration vehicle, the Orion. It's going to launch on a new, very big rocket, uh, bigger even than the Atlas uh, and, and the Deltas that we launch vehicles on now. But it's a very large new system. And then it will have this part that will go somewhere, either to the moon, to an asteroid, or perhaps to Mars one day. Um, the, there is a path forward, but they haven't decided an exact destination yet. Then, once you get there, this is the part that the crew is in here, and then they have some type of a lander that will allow you to land on the surface of some planet or, or, or the moon, and then you'll come back just in the capsule to return to the Earth. To go a very long distance, they'll have to have a place to live. This capsule is nice, but it's very small, so they'll need some type of a habitat like this that the crew can live in and work in while they take a six-month trip to an asteroid or to Mars. That's what the Orion will look like when it's in space with the little space up on the front here where the crew will be. Here's what it looks like by itself. It's about uh, five meters in diameter, so it's relatively large. For going to the moon, they would hold four. They think they can have seven people for shorter missions, but four for a longer mission to go somewhere else. That's what the inside looks like with seats here where they lay on their back and it has different setups or configurations for more crew or fewer crew members. Here's what the crew would see, the panels with windows to allow them to pilot it to go to uh, rendezvous or dock with something else or en route to an asteroid perhaps. The European component of it is the service module. That's the part, it's based on the automated transfer vehicle that uh, the European Space Agency currently builds. And it has the solar arrays and then all the propulsion elements and other things to help you to move in space. And it includes oxygen and other consumables that you have. But this part is going to be built by the European Space Agency, which I think is really good because it ensures that we have international cooperation for this. No one can afford to go and explore our solar system by themselves. So we need to do that as an international effort so that humankind benefits from this. The Orion has a test schedule. Actually, very soon they're going to do the first test in December of this year, maybe even as early as September of this year. They will do a test flight. I'll show you what that looks like in a minute. Then they're going to do an exploration test later where they'll test all of it, and the first crewed test in 2021, and then the first exploration mission sometime after that, but I don't know exactly when. Here's what the test looks like. It's just a couple of orbits. They launch go around the Earth, go further away from the Earth, and then return. And they're testing the re-entry, the heat shield that protects the capsule when they're coming back. Uh, they need to test that. We knew how to do that in the 1960s and early 1970s, but we forgot. We forgot a lot <laughs> about how to do missions like this. When you're coming back from the Moon or from Mars, you're going really, really, really fast, much faster than the space shuttle. So there's a lot more energy to dissipate, to get rid of, so it gets a lot hotter, so we need a different type of heat shield to protect this, the capsule. So they're going to test that. They're going to test the parachutes, as simple 
as parachutes appear to be, they can be quite complicated coming back very fast and deploying in the proper sequence. So they need to test that as well, and that's the purpose of this first test. But that's for exploration. That's for deep space, for going far out there. We need something different to go to the International Space Station. I really like the Russians. I have friends, close friends who are Russians. I like them as a people, but we have political differences that make me worry sometimes about depending too much on any one other country. And I think our international partnership uh, often has some conflict and difficulties, but we worked very, very well together in the past. But you never know what's going to happen with politics. So it's important for the United States to have their own capability for us to be able to get to the space station and to provide crews and equipment to be there. Uh, we've done something about that before because we've been told we have to do it by our Congress. This is what they told us. You must have commercial spacecraft to go to the International Space Station. And you've got to use these commercial spacecraft to take cargo and crews there. The Orion spacecraft won't be ready until 2021 to take crews on missions, so they want something sooner than that. You may have heard recently that the Russians are talking about maybe pulling out of the space station agreement in 2020. So even more reason to have a little urgency, a need to do something a little bit quicker. Well, here's how we can go right now. The Russian progress vehicle and two American vehicles can now take cargo to the space station. My wife is very interested in these vehicles because she's responsible for all the vehicles that go to the International Space Station and the equipment they take up there. So she's happy that we have three different ones, but she tells me that that's still not enough. In the long run, we're going to need six to 8,000 kilograms more capability to get the things that you need to live and work in space, experiments, t-shirts, <laughs> uh, coffee, food, water, all the things that we need to live in space, we need more capability, so we need something else that can help us to go there. So the SpaceX Dragon and the Orbital Sciences Cygnus uh, vehicles are currently taking cargo to the International Space Station and they're commercial vehicles. They were not done by the government, they were done by a commercial company and they're being paid. They're like UPS or DHL. Uh, they haul cargo to the International Space Station and they get paid a very good rate by the way, but they get paid very nicely to take cargo there and keep the space station supplied. Uh, the, the Dragon just returned a, a few days ago, returning cargo from the International Space Station after a delivery, and I think that uh, Orbital Sciences is sending up a vehicle in, I think, in June, in June, with more, more good things for the crew, and crews like to get their food and water, it's good. Uh, this is what the SpaceX vehicle looks like. Typical capsule with solar arrays. It's similar to the Progress. It carries a lot of cargo up there and it gets very close to the space station then is mated with it by the crew on board. Orbital Sciences, a similar vehicle. This shows the robotic arm on the space station that reaches out and grabs the vehicle and then brings it over and plugs it in so they can open the hatches and get all the goodies out of the, the spacecraft. Then they load this one up with trash it burns up in the atmosphere, so it's a garbage truck when it's done. The SpaceX vehicle returns and lands in the ocean and is picked up, and they can get experiments and return cargo from it. So they have a way to get some things back, but this is a good way to get rid of all the extra garbage and other things on the space station to allow it to burn up when it leaves. Well, that's cargo. We're doing it very well. Uh, I was asked today why... We think that it's, uh, it's safe. A lot of people are skeptical about having commercial companies do the spacecraft for NASA, the human spacecraft. Well, they were very skeptical about cargo before these vehicles were successful, and they very quickly developed the rocket and the capsule at a very low cost to the U.S. government, and now they're providing services, delivering things to the space station. They want to do the same thing with humans, to deliver us as cargo to the space station. And the reason that they want to do that is because we're depending solely on the Russians right now. 
So I said, I, I like, I trust them, I believe in their hardware, I believe that they will continue to do what they are supposed to do, but often politicians make you do things that are different than what you would logically and normally want to do. So we have to be careful there, and there's a very good reason for developing other vehicles. There has been tension over the Ukrainian situation. And if you read the quote from Dmitry Rogozin, who's the deputy prime minister, that maybe the U.S. needs to uh, depend on a trampoline to get to the space station. I, I had Christer test out something. Uh, <laughs> and he wasn't very good. <laughs> uh, but we, we probably will use something different to allow us to get there. This is how we hope to go to the space station with one of these vehicles. The SpaceX Dragon Rider vehicle, the Boeing CST-100, or the Sierra Nevada Dream Chaser. Two capsules, and then a lifting body that's very similar to the space shuttle. They all receive funding right now from the U.S. government, and they're all building their hardware. I'll show you a little bit of each of those. There is a competition, and this fall in September, they will announce who is going to go forward and finish building the vehicles. One or two of the companies probably will receive funding and be allowed to finish the vehicles and fly them on a demonstration flight and then carry crews to the International Space Station. I think that's, there's the three that are funded. There's the Boeing CST-100. It's a capsule. It can hold up to seven people. The mission to the space station is only four, but they can take seven for a commercial mission later if they wanted to take tourists to space or scientists to space to a, a civilian space station so they can carry more people. It launches on an Atlas V vehicle, which is a, an American rocket that uses Russian engines by chance. <laughs> Sierra Nevada doing the Dream Chaser, the lifting body, it can also carry seven. It would carry four to the space station, and it also would launch on the top of an Atlas V rocket. All of these could launch on other rockets, so it's possible to launch on an Ariane 5 or maybe even an advanced Falcon vehicle that SpaceX has developed are possibilities. The SpaceX Dragon also can carry seven. It's, a, it's very similar to what they use for cargo now, so it's well along in its development. It's close to being ready to fly, and they say they can fly in 2015 with a crew on board for a test mission. Here's a little presentation by the Boeing company I've borrowed from them. Uh, it shows a little bit about their vehicle. Launches on an Atlas V. It would be in space, controlled by a mission control center in Houston, the same control center that has been used by the shuttle in the past. And then it would do processing where it gets ready to fly at the Kennedy Space Center in Florida, very much like space shuttles. In fact, they're using one of the old space shuttle processing facilities to do their getting ready to fly. Here's what it looks like in more detail. It shows a crew of five here, but this is cargo required for the space station resupply. Uh, certain things that NASA requires. They could put other people there if they chose to instead of cargo. They have a clever way of taking the top off so they can service it and reuse the capsule in the future. Once it lands, they can take that off, get things ready again, put the top back on, and then fly it again, intending to make it cheaper to fly them in the future. Uh, most of the companies are trying to drive the price down so that it can become a more viable commercial transportation system. It's got all the normal equipment you'd have in a, and with the seats shown here. And Boeing is pretty far along with, with it. They're at what would be called critical design review. They're ready to start building the flight hardware just about now. Their concept of operations is to launch, fly to orbit with just this part to the space station, do their work there, stay there for six months, while the crew is working on board the space station and then use that vehicle to return to the Earth with just the capsule part right here. It splashes down in the ocean right now. They would like to land on the land and they're working on airbags similar to ones that we've used for some of our planetary missions going to Mars. Uh, and they would like to land on the land because when they land on the water, you often get damage to some of your equipment and you can't reuse it, and they would like to reuse parts of it. 
You may have heard recently SpaceX landed and they got some salt water, some seawater inside the capsule through a, an open valve. Uh, and things like that worry people about landing in the ocean. So they want to land on the land. And then it will be refurbished and used again for another space flight. These pictures show all the work they've been doing. It's not just a paper design. They've been doing hardware, building things, doing tests of all kinds, testing in the water, uh, testing crews escaping in the water, a lot of crew tests on the inside, looking at the equipment, how it's configured, wind tunnel testing to make sure that it launches on the rocket okay. A lot of the companies are doing similar work to get ready to start building the spacecraft for their test flights. Here's SpaceX. Theirs is a little showier. I don't know if the volume is up. Um, it's okay, it's just music. Oh, okay, that's okay. Anyway, they're showing the Dragon capsule that has flown with cargo to the International Space Station. And then this is a simulation of a similar capsule that would be used for the crew when they launch off of the Atlas V from Florida in the U.S. So, yeah, I'm sorry, the Falcon. <laughs> yeah, the SpaceX has developed their own rocket, the Falcon 9, uh, that they're going to be using for crew also. They're making it a little bit more powerful to take crew to the space station. It launches, it separates, it does burns of the engines to get it to a higher orbit to then go and dock with the International Space Station. They stay docked for about six months. They mostly are carrying people, just a little bit of equipment inside, not much. They're mostly people carriers. After six months, they'll return to the Earth. And like we showed, similar to the Boeing capsule, it uses a heat shield that allows it to re-enter the Earth's atmosphere and endure the high heat as it slows down. Then it uses parachutes. It will also go to the water first, but then they expect, as shown here, it will land on land. I think it shows it landing on the land. Yes, that's land. The Russian Soyuz uses parachutes and then what are called soft landing rockets that allow it to touch down, uh, well, not soft, but fairly soft. Uh, this will be much softer and better if they're able to do this. Yeah, they'll be happy. <laughs> so that's the SpaceX concept. Sierra, ne Sierra Nevada Corporation, the lifting body, it's the one that's a little bit different, much more like the space shuttle. It launches on the Atlas V. Uh, it'll be just exposed, which is unusual for a spacecraft. Normally they have a covering over it, a fairing, to protect it, but they want to be able to get away from the rocket in a bad situation very quickly, so they're launching without a fairing. They've done a lot of wind tunnel testing to make sure that it's okay to launch this way. It uses its own rocket motors, uh, hybrid rocket motors, uh, to get away from the rocket and then to go to the space station. It docks backwards uh, to the International Space Station. Then it stays for six months like the others, waiting for the crew to go home. All of these vehicles could be used as emergency vehicles should there be a problem on the space station. At almost any time they could climb in and then return to the Earth if they had a problem. The Dream Chaser will depart from the space station and then return very, very similar to the way the space shuttle did with protective tiles on the bottom, ceramic tiles on the bottom of it, and it will fly back and land on a runway, intending to land at the Kennedy Space Center in Florida, where it launched from, but it could land at almost any uh, international airport of that, of that length. It uh, doesn't require special navigation aids like the space shuttle did, so it can land just about anywhere if necessary. Uh, this shows a picture of it actually landing. There was a practice test with it to test just the last part of the, the flight and the landing in California just a few months ago. This is a quick summary of all of the partners from the NASA perspective of how the programs are going. It, 
It includes Blue Origin, who is not funded by NASA, but they have an agreement and they exchange information. So NASA helps them with expertise, with providing technical experts to help them uh, when they need help, but they're not giving them any money to build their, their program. Their program is funded by a billionaire uh, who likes space. I'd like to have a friend like that. These are showing some of the actual tests that have gone on over the last year of the different vehicles. A lot of progress has been made and they're getting close to, to really starting to build the ones that would go into space now. A lot of the typical analysis, uh, engineering wind tunnel tests, building hardware to test in different ways. Uh, you can see the Dream Chaser did the flight test. Of course, SpaceX is getting a lot of testing done on orbit in space with their vehicle. That'll be very similar. <clears throat> So they've made some good progress in the last year, so it's, it's becoming more real with the, the future human spacecraft. There could be some others. Uh, these are generally suborbital ones. The Blue Origin New Shepard that they had some in the NASA video. The Lynx is just two people. They're going to use a, uh, a, a rocket engine to take two people to suborbital space where you fly a trajectory and get just a couple of minutes of weightlessness. Very similar to what you probably have heard more about. Spaceship 2, which is the Virgin Galactic vehicle. Spaceship 1, a smaller version, flew to the edge of space in a parabola with a couple of minutes of, of weightlessness. And they're getting ready, they say later this year, probably 2015, they'll have tourists who are flying on board and get a few minutes of, to experience the, the weightlessness of space. Um, and then there was a Russian vehicle that was being done with a European space agency called Clipper. It was another lifting body type vehicle that the program was canceled, but there, I still hear rumblings about it once in a while that they may, it may come back one day. But those are different types of, of human spacecraft that would be suborbital rather than orbital. But there's a lot of things going on with human spaceflight to allow us to build new vehicles that will take human beings to low Earth orbit while, at least on the U.S. side, they're planning on going out um, to more distant destinations in our solar system. But Christopher, I think we can take some questions. I had a few things on space station life, but, but I, I think we've had enough of that. We can, we can answer some questions now if you'd like. Well, I'm, I'm not an expert on the Chinese. I know a little bit about the Shenzhou is their capsule. It's very similar to the Russian Soyuz. And the Chinese launched their first human into space, which was only the third nation to have a launch system to do that in 2003. Yang Li Wei was the first uh, Chinese uh, astronaut. Since then, they've launched 10 different people. Uh, they've launched two women. They've done, a space, they've done spacewalks, and they have a small space station that they have spent a couple of weeks on, and they plan to go back and do more. They have stated goals of going to the moon and going to Mars. So it's good. It's another space race, I think. Uh, they, they've been very aggressive and made progress very quickly by using knowledge from you know, other programs that have developed these systems, and they didn't waste any time when they started. They, they moved very quickly to develop their programs to, to catch up a little bit. So they're, they're moving very fast. Do you know any more, Christer? We, we um, will we'll go see them next year. Christer yeah. just came back from China. Yeah, this is Mr. Zhang Levy, first astronaut. He's actually organizing this congress. Up, that's all. Oh, mute there, so. Uh, that's right, Mr. 
Deng Liwei is uh, now preparing the Astronaut Congress in September in Beijing. Okay, do we have any, do we have any other questions? I'm sure we do. Don't be shy. Astrobiology, we have a just nu uh, som jag vet som jobbar med astrobiologi men uh, det är helt klart att det uh, skulle kunna bli för det och jag besökte uh, uh, en av de större grupperna på uh, eller, som tillhör KTO som jobbar med biologi bio, biofysik biochips och grejer Så om det möjligen skulle kunna, fi, kunna hitta på någonting Mars One. What's that a question? Oh, Mars the pro, the pro, Yeah, the project Mars One. Uh, the Mars One program, for those that are not familiar with it, Mars One is a program, it's a, a, someone who is trying to raise money to send people to Mars one way and to colonize there. And they've had a lot of people who volunteered who said they would go. Uh, to be honest, if I had a way to go to Mars that I thought I would be able to go there and to survive there, I would be willing to try the one-way trip. But I, I think that it's a wonderful thing for people to think about and talk about and to open our minds to possibly doing something that bold. I don't think that they will have enough money to do it. That, that's always the problem. It, it costs a lot of money to go to space. So I think that they will wind up not raising enough money to actually do it. But if, it, if we talk about it, now, maybe we'll do it in 10 years or 20 years or 50 years as when we have better technologies or when we have someone who's, who's very bold and very wealthy who wants to, to do that. Uh, Elon Musk, who founded SpaceX, has said he wants to go to Mars. And one day, you never know. That's an excellent question. The question is about the re-entry with the heat shield. Why do you come at such a steep angle to... Uh, and make, make it so hot? Why do you dissipate your energy so quickly and, and increase the temperature so much? Why not do it a little bit at a time? You could do it a little bit at a time, but it would take a very long time to re-enter. Re and usually when we start our re-entry, we want to go ahead and come back because of the, it's dynamic, it's very hot, and things can go wrong. And you, you want, once you've started back in, I think, to do it more slowly. You could take weeks and months to slowly dissipate the energy, but eventually you would pick up speed and you would continue to pick up speed and you would still have some heating, but I don't think it would be quite as much because you'd have less energy to dissipate. I will look to my physics uh, friend for more detail on I believe that that would be the reason is we don't want to take that long uh, to do it, but it's an excellent idea. I mean, uh, it, it has been used at some occasions, right? Slow. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And there's also talk of things like uh, balloots, big, uh, or big parachute-like or balloon-like thing that could be much bigger that would be inflated in the front to slow it down with the, the energy dissipated over a larger area. And that could also require less heat. But that's more complicated. And then you have to carry something that's complicated that could have a problem. And if it didn't work, you would die. So you want very simple systems usually for, for this as well. Coming back from somewhere like the moon, you, don't, you, you want to get captured in Earth orbit. If you came and just touched along the atmosphere or, or did a, just a little bit of a breaking burn, you would still be in a very big orbit that would probably be months or, or even more long. So it would take a very long time to come back. So that's why they generally go at a steeper angle, so they're captured into an orbit around, a, a closer in orbit around the Earth. Or the, the okay, so flight's coming from far out. We have a question here at the back. Uh, I don't know if you can answer this, but uh, will the average uh, citizen be able to travel to the moon in the near future? Uh, sorry, could, could you repeat? No, the question was, will the average citizen be able to travel to the moon in the near future? Who's the question for? <laughs> <laughs> well, um, there will be some time before I would say the average citizen can uh, even go to space. But um, what Jim showed, I think, is how much is developing, and which implies how many more people will get an opportunity to go to space in the fairly 
close future, and not far beyond that is the moon. Uh, it will still be an expensive ticket for quite some time, but uh, not long from now, you don't have to be a professional astronaut to have a, be a, basically the only one has a chance to go to space. I think if you have enough money, you can go to a company called Space Adventures, right. and you can book a trip with the Russians to go around the moon. You wouldn't land on the surface, but you could go around the moon. They're not ready to do that yet, but if they got enough money, a down payment, then you could book the, the flight today. Uh, probably wouldn't happen for a few years. Uh, but like Christer said, commercialization will allow more people to be able to go to space. The ones who will do suborbital uh, will happen within a year. And then orbital will follow that as soon as there are more vehicles that are available. So by the time you're just a few years older. Okay, we have another question at the back. Yeah, I have a question for Jim. I read that you had done one of the longest spacewalks up to date, and I wondered what the mission was and why did it take so long? Oh. <laughs> <laughs> I, I work very slowly. <laughs> there, there was a big, very good reason, actually. We had a lot to do, but most spacewalks are planned for about six hours at at most. How long were yours, Christer? Well, the longest was just over seven. I would say, I mean, they never planned more than six and a half or yeah, so. Yeah, so, so they planned for shorter, but for this spacewalk, we did a lot of things, and then they were going to move a, a module called a multi-purpose logistics module, and it was the first time they were going to move it from the, the shuttle, the space shuttle payload bay, and put it onto the space station. They were very uncertain if they could do it very well. So they wanted us to stay outside in case they had a problem, and then we could go and help to fix the problem because they really needed for this module to attach because it had lots of supplies and other things inside. So we stayed outside to wait for that to, to happen. And so we got to just hang out in the, in the airlock. The suit doesn't provide capability for that long of a mission normally, but you can plug in and get more oxygen and get more water for cooling. The one thing you can't get is more capability to eliminate carbon dioxide from inside the suit. When we breathe out, we breathe out carbon dioxide. It has to be absorbed in canisters that are in your backpack. Fortunately, my crewmate Susan Helms and I, we didn't breathe very hard, <laughs> so we didn't have too much carbon dioxide, and so we were able to stay out for the full almost nine hours uh, while we were, were waiting a couple of extra hours for them to move this module over there and then we finished up uh, with eight hours and 56 minutes. If I'd known it was only four minutes before nine hours, I would have waited before we closed <laughs> the hatch. So it wasn't you who was slow, it was them operating. It was slow, okay. We, we, we had our issues also, we, were, we worked a little slow. But. Thank you for your presentation, it was really good. I wonder what you think about uh, preparation, for example, the Mars project or going around the moon. What kind of preparation do you think the people would need? Or just any general public to prepare? Exactly. Yeah, the question is what would you need to do to prepare to go to Mars? Uh, settle all of your affairs here on the ground. <laughs> My, my crewmate, Susan Helms, before we went to live on the space station for six months, she turned in all of her credit cards, she sold her car, she closed her apartment and stored all of her furniture. She said she was getting rid of all of her Earth things so she could live in space. I think you'd need to do something like that, maybe, uh, and you'd have to mentally prepare for a very long trip. With our current rocket technologies, it'll take about six to eight months, depending on when we go, the timing for the orbits of the planets, uh, for you to make that trip. And I'm afraid it would be very boring. While you're leaving the Earth, you can look back at the Earth. When you're getting near Mars, you can look at Mars, but a great vast expanse between there, there's not much to look at. Maybe if you were an astrophysicist and wanted to look at the stars, but after a while, I think you'd need something to do. So maybe you need to give them equipment that they would use on Mars that they would have to put together and assemble during their flight. And if they couldn't assemble it, they couldn't land. So I think someone would have to prepare mentally for a very long trip. 
with some inactivity, uh, maybe like a long cruise on a ship without much work to do, would be the hardest thing, I think, to prepare. Plus, you have all the training. For space station, uh, well, I mean, you, uh, Krista and I trained a very long time on just the Soyuz spacecraft. For training for space station, I trained for four years with my crew and uh, with and without them. But a very long time to learn about all the systems. If things break, you, you have to be able to fix it. And you get help from experts, but you still have to know where to find things, how to fix them, and how to do things. And you've got to understand the science. If you send someone to Mars, you certainly want them to understand geology and, and to be able to, uh, to know what they're looking at when they're there and how to get the right samples and do the science that has to be done there. So I think there'd be a lot of things. What other things maybe, Christopher? Tell your family well, goodbye. Yeah. Well, I, I can tell a little fun story about uh, how to prepare. You mentioned Susan there. I was sharing office with you and Susan at the time, and, and I overheard a telephone call that Susan got, and someone's apparently questioning her why she was canceling if it was the phone or something like that. And she said, well, I'm moving away. Yeah, well, where are you moving then? Well, I'm kind of leaving. And yeah, well, can you tell me where are you going? She, uh, that, so Susan didn't really want to say, I'm leaving the Earth for half a year. <laughs> Maybe they wouldn't have trusted her. So, <laughs> so I asked her, why didn't you say it? Well, so, yeah, that's it. Thank you very much for this interesting thing. The interest in the public, does it spill over so that the students in the U.S. is also interested in space education? And can you use that? That's my main question. Can you use it as a leverage to raise the interest in STEM studies? Yes, I think that we are trying to do that. How well, I don't know. I personally believe that we need to use space to help us to encourage students to study hard subjects, learn about space, to inspire them to want to explore, to learn more. And I think the center here at KTH will help to get students in engineering, uh, a lot of things that you need to understand space and be able to go to space, to build things for space, and to, to use space the solar system. So I, I believe that it is helping us. I, in my classroom, I teach space subjects. I also teach graduate students projects using a spacecraft, but they're learning engineering. They're not learning about space engineering. They're learning engineering and they're learning mathematics and science and how to do computer-aided design. They even learn to weld and to do other things, practical skills as well. They do that because they're very interested in space, so they wanted to work on a spaceship design. Uh, but it's encouraging to, to learn other things. I think our young children also can be inspired by space. Uh, I was, when I was a child, I read science fiction a lot. And it, I was speaking with uh, the, the person from the Swedish team. Yeah, Thomas von Heine. And he said he read science fiction a lot as a child and still today. And I think it inspires us to think about things that are bigger than we are and that are broader and more exciting and interesting that can uh, capture our imaginations and, and help us to want to learn more. So I, I think it absolutely can affect STEM education and does. Hi, Jim. Hi, I'm Karin with Spaceport Sweden. And you touched upon uh, the new suborbital vehicles for space tourism, but I'd like to hear your view on the capability of these vehicles also for science and research and experience, experiments. Yeah, I think that there's a, a certainly a, a need there. We, we have right now very short periods of time of weightlessness for testing things and doing experiments. Drop towers that drop things for a very short time, seconds. Aircraft that fly parabolas that have a little bit of apparent weightlessness for 20 to 30 seconds. And then we have space where we go and spend months at a time. But it's very hard to go from that airplane to space. And it's very expensive. It takes a long time to get experiments there. There's a huge gap in time. Having suborbital flights where they fly these long trajectories and they have three to five minutes 
to do something in weightlessness. You can do much more serious experiments and science work in that time. It still isn't months, but it's not seconds. Uh, so you have a much broader time. So I think there is certainly a place for doing other science for longer periods of time using the, the suborbital vehicles. Uh, the, most of the, the press is about the tourist part of it for someone to pay, I think, about $200,000 to go for this experience. But I think scientists can take advantage of it also to do shorter experiments, but longer than what they can do on Earth. And it maybe would prepare for doing something for a, a space station flight or a s orbital flight where you want to make sure it works before you take it to orbit because it's so expensive. And the experiments like uh, Christer's students will be doing with the, the CubeSats is another step in between. Those are just very small. It's a different dimension that's different. It's easier to get them there, but they're very small. Thank you. And I have a question for both of you. Um, astronauts that have been before talk about the overview effect and how looking back at Earth, it's a transformational experience. What's your experience, Krista and, and Jim? Oh, well, uh, can you say what really was the question? I the overview effect. So a lot of people that have been to space talk about the experience when you sort of turn around and you see Earth from above. Or I from mean, the, the overview of the Earth? Mm. Yeah, that's... Um, when it takes 90 minutes to go one orbit around Earth, it gives you a feeling that the Earth is not so big, for sure. And, and uh, uh, you don't see any borders down there. Sometimes it looks kind of fragile when you see the very thin atmosphere. So these factors together uh, kind of gives you a feeling we better take care of this Earth, all of us, and, and uh, work for the benefit of everybody. And I think that's something very common among all the space flyers that we kind of feel that we need to take care, uh, stewardship sometimes of the Earth, and we work in space in a very kind of, uh, what is the right word, not very really fragile, but um, dangerous environment together, and we uh, kind of take care of that together, we need to do the same on Earth. I mean, th those are the kind of, I would say, the thoughts you get. For me, it was not a religious or emotional experience. It was more a scientific engineering thing. I got there, wow, look at this. It's a very special view. And the way I think about it, it's, it's like uh, if you climb to the top of a mountain and look back at the earth, you see it from a different perspective. And it's beautiful. It's gorgeous. And, and you, you feel very good about achieving that place to look back. It's the same thing with space for me. It's looking at the Earth from a very different perspective and seeing it in a different way. Like Christer said, we see a lot of it very fast. So you're big. It's very fragile. Our atmosphere is this tiny little edge around this globe that we have and you realize that there's not much taking care of us here on the earth so you think about things a little bit differently but I think it's just because you're in a different perspective I know there have been some people who have had a much more emotional response and religious response to it but for me it was more just different perspective on things it was very beautiful and special in fact I had some pictures that I <laughs> I can always share my pictures. Up, oh, ah. <laughs> <laughs> there we go. Looking out the window is very special. Where's this? <laughs> well, I was not taken from my sis. <laughs> <laughs> no, but it's, yeah, it's too easy. Uh, of course, you know where this is. Great. Oh, where's this? Of course, that's Egypt with the Mediterranean Sea and the Nile River. That's an easy one. What about this one? Also easy. Yeah, Manhattan. That's oh. less easy. Where's this? Anyone who gets this one gets a free ride to space. <laughs> Maybe they want to go there instead. <laughs> uh, you'll never know. Yeah, it's an atoll in the Pacific. One of thousands. I don't know what it is. And of course, sunsets. That's a great place. That's where we see the <laughs> thin atmosphere. Yeah. Uh, hi. Uh, do you think that the private companies will uh, rule the space industry and what will be the importance of the go government? In, in the United States, the government still has a very important role. They're paying for these companies to build these vehicles, so they will have 
they will see what they're doing. The companies get to decide about the design, but they have to meet the NASA requirements and rules. They, they have to meet all of their safety standards. So they have to do everything the NASA way. It's the same as it's always been. Every human spacecraft built in the United States was built by a private company, by a commercial company, with the government providing money and oversight to tell them how they wanted it done. So it's being done the same way. It's just the difference now is the commercial companies own that equipment and they can sell it to someone else. So it doesn't just have to be government astronauts who go, but private astronauts could buy a flight on it as well, or you could do a private science on it if you wanted to. That's the big difference because the U.S. government decided they wanted to stimulate the commercial industry. So they're providing some money. They'll have a capability they can use, and the commercial companies will have a capability they can sell to others to use. So I think their role will be to broaden the market, to bring in more people, more science, more research, uh, more exploration in the low, Earth, low Earth orbit, and the government will get what they wanted, which is a way to get crews to the International Space Station, and they will have stimulated the commercial space industry. But isn't it also true that um, to more or less big extent these companies also invest themselves money? Yes. Much more than it's been before. Yes, they, they invest a lot also. The, the government gives money, but it's not enough. That's why they've kept three companies going forward. They invested about $1 billion, but the companies invest a substantial amount of money. It's, it's, uh, it's not publicly disclosed, but it is, it's hundreds of millions of dollars are being invested by the companies to make sure that they get everything done because the government is not providing enough uh, to do it completely. So that's one reason that they can own the rights to the hardware and the intellectual property once uh, they have finished building the vehicle. I have a personal question. Uh, recently there was an experiment with uh, uh, people that were locked in for I think about 15 months for a simulated uh, ecological experiment. Of the Mars 500? Could you speak closer to the mic and repeat okay. the question? Sorry. Please. Recently, there was an experiment uh, where people were uh, for a long time locked in together uh, for a simulated trip to, the, I think it was the Mars? Mars 500. Uh, Mars 500, yeah. Um, uh, knowing what it is to be locked in a crowded space and, and working together with other people, would you take part in an experiment like that? So, was the question whether we took part in the simulation or in the real flight? Or oh, in the simulation. Oh, in the simulation, Mars 500. <laughs> no, I, I would not. I mean, uh, I think they did it partly because they really, I mean, they, they hope that that will help them to go to space. Uh, and, um, but uh, it's, it was a very valuable uh, uh, simulation. So I'm glad that some people did volunteer to do it. <laughs> Would you do it? <laughs> I would go to Mars. Uh, same here. I would, I would take the trip to Mars, but I wouldn't do a simulation for 500 days. No. That's a very long time. <laughs> uh, thank you all for excellent presentations. And uh, this might be a little bit too much sci-fi, but my question is, and it involves medicine, has there, has there been any tryouts where they put people through like an anesthetic procedure to keep to uh, to to manage them to stay years in space? What well, I'm not sure I understood the question. Have Have they been trying to put people to sleep for longer Hibernation. longer periods? Hibernation. Oh, if there's been any uh, real experiment to see if I could pe yeah. put people into hibernation. Exactly. Not my knowledge. I don't, not with humans. There are some animals they've done that with. I think that they've shown some uh, length of time that they can hi have them hibernate. I, I don't remember what it was, if it was a, a rat or some, some animal like that that they've, they've done it with and they think that you possibly could do it. It's, but it is science fiction right now, maybe on the edge of science. 
Uh, but we're, the reason for having the space station is to learn more about long duration, long space flights, so that when we go to Mars or somewhere, we'll understand what happens to the human being. Uh, we, we lose bone mass. Uh, we get more radiation than you do here on the Earth. There are, are problems with eyes now that they're finding uh, from long duration flights. So we need to understand that better before we send people out into deep space where we can't bring them back easily. We can't protect them from radiation very much. There's as you heard today, there's a lot of people looking at re research on radiation because it is something we're very concerned about. Uh, so those are the things we will learn from living and working on the space station before we send people out further from the Earth. Well, time is running. Uh, again, thank you, everybody who came here. I hope you learned something new, you enjoyed it. Uh, before we go, though, uh, Special thanks to Jim coming here, and uh, we have a small kind of gift for you. One of is the KTH uh, kind of pin, and uh, something a little uh, more Swedish things inside, I think. I oh, don't have to. <laughs> and while you are unpacking, uh, let's see, I'm also curious. <laughs> As uh, kind of a Swedish, uh, you know, glasses. Very, maybe not coming from space, but from Sweden. Well, thank you. Let's thank Jim once again.